Hello, I'm, I'm Stuart Rozelle. I'm a PhD student based in the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute studying invasive species. I'm currently based in their plant health department who study both invasive species and plant health. But I'm not going to present about that today. Actually, I'm presenting about some projects I was involved with before I started my PhD project. And I'm still involved with through the Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust, setting up and teaching volunteer groups to start their own wildlife surveys. I'm presenting this mainly about teaching insect identification, but really these identification skills, teaching methods apply to teaching how to survey any group of wildlife. They're very, they cross over multiple disciplines. Now it's important to mention here that I am not a trained teacher. I learned these methods largely because staff at university where I was doing my undergraduate degree in Cambridge allowed me to take on projects and to just learn to teach by trying to teach people and getting it wrong and then getting it right again. So this is not based on professional teaching methods, but what I find to be successful. So don't view this as this is how to teach. View this as here's some tips. Here's what helps me and what might help you as well. So before I start, why am I presenting this? Insect identification is hard and teaching insect identification is even harder when you're, especially when your audience might not have a scientific background. This is because within species, within species groups, for example, you see the Orthosia species on the left, all closely related moths in the family Noctuidae they are really quite similar to the uneducated eye. And on the right, we have a couple of moths in other families in the bottom of the caterpillar. And in what aren't very distant groups, you have to look at completely different features to identify them. So that's one of the challenges teaching entomology. You have diversity between the groups you're trying to teach about and within the groups. And you need to look at detailed features and it isn't always obvious what you need to look at without having guidance. Now, I hope this presentation is useful to experts in the audience who I want to know a bit more about how to teach to younger audiences or less experienced people, but also people in the audience who aren't experts who perhaps want to know how to start. Excuse the notes because I haven't practiced this very much, and it's actually quite hard to put teaching methods into a logical presentation. This is what I discovered on Monday afternoon. But some of the challenges relating to why it's hard to teach entomology also relate to how we learn entomology at university. We learn really from taxonomy, which is actually quite a complex science. And all of our identification keys are based on this. But we have to translate that into a far more understandable method of teaching identification. And taxonomy involves loads of long words and anatomy and families and things. They don't make it easy to teach for entomology to non-scientific audiences. Now I'm saying that as a scientist, I, I get the importance of all that, but also they do make it quite hard to communicate. So when I'm teaching, the most important thing when I first get a group of volunteers is I have three priorities. First, before I even touch the organisms I'm teaching about, I need to understand who I'm teaching from group discussion. So on the right, I've got a survey group I was involved in in Cambridge University of Botanic Gardens, one of the first survey groups I set up. And the most important thing here is to get students or volunteers or whoever you're teaching looking at insects and you need to guide how they observe them and find out how they observe them. One of the first things I do is I don't show the volunteers I'm teaching an identification book. I give very little background on the taxonomy first. I simply show them a range of insects. For example, you've got comparison of 
head structures. I'll probably choose a slightly less detailed example for a first impression of insects for volunteers. And I show them to the audience and I uh, ask, you know, what do you see? What's the difference between those? So perhaps to demonstrate that, is there anyone in the audience who hasn't done much moth identification for who would like to compare those three images at the bottom? Specifically, we have the palps are important in identifying families of moths. If there's anyone brave, someone must be brave. I should have planted someone brave in the audience. Go on. I think we've got someone coming, but no. Lights in your eyes. No. So we have the palps here. The, we've got the leafy leaf family on the right, the base leaf family on the left, and the reed leaf. It's now off. In the middle, and these palps are on the front of the head. I just want you to sort of say, you know, what do you see? What's the difference between these two groups? Uh, shorter here in the middle. This one's pretty dark. This one's pretty yeah. light. Great. So that is a difference between detailed species. But as mentioned specifically, the shape of the palp mm -hmm. and the shape of the head here and the proportions inside of them. Can you describe here the proportions? And how these differ between these three groups. Yeah, I suppose this one here at the end is a bit more of a curve. Yes, and they stick up above the height of the head. Yeah. Uh, this one's a lot shorter. Yes, so if you look at Lasto basically on the left, on the left, the parts are much less pronounced. And if you look in the middle, this is actually photographed from the top, not from the side. But you can see the parts stick out in front. Yeah. That's enough audience engagement. <laughs> See, that's just an example of the teaching methods I use. You need to understand how your how students see something before you explain them the right way of doing it. Because, for example, I should have asked your name. Sorry. What was your name? Sorry. Uh, Save it. Thought it was. Xavier could have given me the right answer the first time there. And you might ask, you know, what would I do in that case? I would actually ask him, you know, and why you say that? Because it's important and to make sure that people are using the right features to identify things. One of the other priorities I teach when I first get a group of volunteers is I teach a little bit of taxonomy and just the structure of an identification book to us scientists in the audience, it probably now comes as first nature how to use an identification book, but it's structured by families and taxonomic groups. To volunteers, this isn't always obvious. So you do need to explain a little bit of taxonomy for that. But I do try and minimize the amount of terminology because I find that sometimes that deters people from learning entomology. I've gone on in quite a lot of detail about these first lessons, but I find it really is important to prioritize these because they give people the platform to teach each other and themselves insect identification and to communicate with experts on their own to contact experts and ask for advice. I think one another set of comparisons. Um, one of the most difficult things to teach people to look at is to compare raw shapes and resting postures, which they aren't used to identify all insect groups, but they are quite important in moths and butterflies in this case. And in this case, it is really important to have comparison and a good method of visualizing insects to a large group, to a large audience. I would often use technology such as digital microscopes to show one image to groups as I did at the start there. 
because it allows everyone to look at the same thing and comment on it at the same time. Now, in the longer term, I don't continue to teach volunteers in person for very long. I actually try to teach people the basics of insect identification in a matter of a couple of sessions in a couple of weeks. And then I simply step back and I let the volunteers take the lead in the survey. This is a mistake which I made when I first started teaching, because I tried to guide people too much. And I think a lot of experts probably do that. They, they design a really strict teaching course and they try and follow it. I try to take, try to let people I'm teaching take the lead and simply guide their discussion around comparisons. Now, this approach does rely on having a group of volunteers and the right amount of diversity. So I, would, I prefer to teach actually in early spring, though there isn't a huge diversity of insects at that time of year. It means that students can gradually learn new species as they appear, rather than doing an insect survey in like June and being bombarded with several hundred species, which can be challenging and a little bit deterring. Eventually, I might not be present at a group of volunteers doing the survey, and I'm only supervising them at a distance. And technology such as chats and forums, for example, I use Facebook chats quite a lot, so that people can send me photographs and I can comment on the identifications and just keep an eye on the group's self-learning, you know, teaching each other. And I do sometimes highlight particularly unusual finds to volunteer groups so that they know to look out for them. For example, the moth on the top left there, Afro Arima and Philadella, long name. It is a little bit challenging, and I probably wouldn't highlight it as, as something for new entomologists to look out for, but as the group develops and learn more skills, I judge you know, when, when, they, when it would be appropriate to introduce them to these more challenging groups to look out for. And often I'm teaching a group who are perhaps carrying out a survey, which is important for a conservation body, for example, volunteer with the Wild Farm and Wetlands Trust at the moment. So to link the survey group in with the priorities of the conservation body, I highlight species which are of particular interest to conservation projects. For example, that species is one of grassland and there is a grassland conservation area at Castle SB. I also highlight a lot of wetland species to the group because they are our survey priorities. As the group develops, I might also bring in other skills and run specific training courses. But at this stage, it's really dependent on, on what the group wants. And the course as such I use to teach every volunteer group is not strictly defined. For example, some some groups will show an interest in things like dissection. So I would run a dissection course. Other groups really wouldn't. Um, others might show more of an interest in looking for field signs or caterpillars, such as the leaf miner. I've got the Phil and Eric, the leaf miner there at the bottom, which Phil and Eric is a big genus. And if people are keen to identify it, I'm really keen to teach people how to identify them and survey them because I know that they won't be able to identify these as adults in the light trapping methods, which I first teach volunteers. I also try to make use of seasons when I'm teaching, um, as I mentioned, starting early in spring, so people aren't bombarded with a huge amount of diversity. And in the off season in winter, I would approach museums and collections and give people tours of insect collections, this can be quite useful for species which are rarer, 
which might be of conservation priority, because I know that if I run a course, I can't promise to show someone a live example of these. So being able to visit a collection and show them, here's a rare species you might see if you get one, please send me a photograph or we might miss this record. That is the difference between a data point and not having a data point. Other courses I might run are maybe more linked to the practical aspects, such as on the left there, with an electrician in our, group, in our volunteer recording groups in Cambridge. So we ran a course on building a light trap. You know, it's making use of the skills you have and the people that you're teaching as well. And at a later stage, I always try to involve people in the data, how we summarize it and record it. A lot of people might shy away from involving volunteers in data processing. I take the opposite approach that I try to make sure volunteers understand why we're doing the survey and how the data is processed because it means that they'll understand a lot more of the importance of recording details such as location and abundance accurately and where mistakes can be made and the consequences of those mistakes. In the longer term, I tend to end up with a group of maybe, I would hope, five or six volunteers who are teaching each other and carrying out a survey independently. And it, it pays off like the image on the bottom right there, Pachystola acrosantha, another long name, why are there so many? That was sent to me last week from a volunteer whom I started teaching less than a year ago. It's not a particularly big moth, it's four, five millimeters long, it's a micro moth. But this, this person knew enough to highlight it to me and contact me and say, I think this is what it is, it's rare, can you confirm that? And it's just, just to show you, you know, that if you teach people the skills to learn and teach these in the right way, you can teach people detailed identification in quite a short time and get valuable records. That there is the fourth Irish record from a volunteer recorder who's only been identifying moths for pretty seriously for less than a year. And I think there's the, it's the discussion which I encourage between volunteers and taking photographs and sharing them that really allows those sorts of records to come in. But just to end on a picture of one of Castlesky's really nice habitats in salt marsh, I always try to remember, try to keep a focus on what's the end result. Because a lot, a lot of times, if when people don't can't reach the entomology, they lose that focus on the end result. And if I'm serving, setting up a survey group, the end result is data to protect these habitats and understand. And I always try and make sure that volunteers see the uses of the data that they're providing. I show them the species lists. And I also show them the gaps in the data because every survey has its limitations. And it's important to keep participants aware of issues like that. Now, there are limitations. Um, I think it's important to recognize these, that, for example, some groups can't be identified without dissection. That is challenging for volunteer-led surveys because most volunteers don't have access to microscopy, maybe aren't, wouldn't be particularly skilled with microscopes, would be deterred by keys, or there are some insect groups which would be a particularly high priority in certain conservation areas. And it's really important to get an expert in to get those identified accurately. So there are limitations to volunteer-led surveys and things where there is a place for experts as well, really focused surveys. But that said, a lot of our wildlife groups can be approached by non-scientists with the right teaching. And as a teacher, I am self-taught and I'm always learning. And 
I'm improving those issues in my own teaching courses. I think it's important to recognize that, that when we're teaching, we learn from the people we're teaching and we improve our own teaching methods by gathering feedback occasionally and ensuring we teach using discussions. Now, when I was setting up this presentation, Josh and I briefly discussed perhaps having a forum on discussing different methods of engagement and teaching insect identification. I'm just going to put that idea out there. Please contact us if you're interested because we thought it was quite a good idea, but a little bit too long for this, for this meeting. So, thanks for listening. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, just like the highlights, obviously, the work that Stuart does and the volunteers do and the contribution that that makes to a lot of our important sites and, you know, further our knowledge. And not only that, obviously, the kind of work it is to pass on those skills and knowledge to others that are interested in getting them enthused and um, obviously increase the amount of people which we all recognize we need to contribute to um, species reporting. Uh, just a quick question. Um, obviously in recent years there's been a lot of species identification apps um, which a lot of a lot of volunteers and amateur um, recorders are using. So just what's your view of those and, and of them I would say they're useful. They're useful for they're useful for people to get a hint on what something might be when they have no idea. But unless we teach people the identification skills to identify something on their own and to look at species descriptions and maybe the odd couplet from keys and to observe the right features, we can't be sure that people will be using these, these tools accurately because well, you need to know when something's wrong and sometimes these apps are still wrong. So it's just important to have the skills, the core skills and identification to know how accurate the tool is that you're using. They are improving. They are improving and becoming really very impressive but they're still just a guide in a lot of cases. Any, uh, any more questions? Uh, how are you finding um, uh, the museum collections like by uh, what they've been in um, for, for your teaching? They have been the difference between seeing the full selection of a family when I'm teaching and being able to show people the variation in really closely related species and not having the full selection of the family. For example, when I was trapping in Cambridge, I was trapping in quite an urban area. Our species came out quite late in spring. We lacked woodland. And I had to use those museum collections to show people the variety. And it means that you can show people the variety of organisms which are about to come out. So I could perhaps, for example, I could show people species which are going to emerge in May or June, I could teach them about those now so that when the survey time comes along, those species, they're fresh in people's memory, and it just makes it easier for people to get into the identification a little bit more quickly. Thanks. Um, so I think we'll move on into the final talk. We're going to uh, just combine the final, step, the final session there. Um, so next one is... Uh,